Okay, we're going to get do module three, developing interpersonal skills, chapter three in your book. And um, first we will do some of the uh, need to know words. So there's a few here at the end, visually impaired, hearing impaired, cognitively impaired, and aphasia. So the word aphasia, uh, I, I'm sorry, the word impaired means difficulty in, and we use that a lot in healthcare. And we're going to use it here and here. So what that means is um, visually impaired, not being able to see with your vision. So difficulty in vision, so you kind of reverse it. Hearing impaired, difficulty in hearing. Cognitively impaired, um, cognitive means your ability to um, kind of concentrate and think and that your mental ability. So difficulty in thinking and processing and your mental ability. Um, and then the last one here, aphasia, is difficulty with communicating. And it's a, it's the kind of difficulty where the person has a physical disability in communicating, usually with strokes. So here's your objectives, and it's mostly developing um, positive relationships, knowing why those relationships would be good or not good, using effective communication skills. What are some barriers, and they could be emotional barriers. Um, what are defense behaviors, so you're not going to take it uh, to heart, and how to uh, communicate with residents who are physically impaired. Okay, here's Maslow. Maslow was a psychologist in the 1800s, but we use his this pyramid a lot um, because it just fits with healthcare so well. Um, so what he says is the bottom part of the pyramid needs to be fulfilled before there's concerns about higher up in the pyramid. And it doesn't, it isn't, so it doesn't mean that you um, don't care about all the things because you do at once, but to kind of put them in a priority in most situations, right? So physical, physiological means physical. Well, breathing, if I'm short of breath, <gasps> At that point, I probably don't care if my husband's coming over and kissing me. I need someone to help me breathe, right? Um, and do I feel like I have a big self-esteem? You know, do I feel comfortable in my skin? I'm worried about breathing. Same thing if ex excretion here, the last one, that means to be able to eliminate, to go have a bowel movement, to urinate. Um, how many times have you ever had to urinate in a car and you're, or wherever, and you're waiting and waiting and all you're thinking of, you're not, you don't even want to carry on a conversation. You just want to relieve yourself, right? So it's a way to think about it. Now they all overlap. However, we're looking at physical safety. Do they feel safe? Um, love and belonging, self-esteem. How do I feel? Do I feel confident? Do I feel like people respect me? And self-actualization is I the, the the highest thing that I'm working for. So it's different in different parts of your life. Right now, the highest thing might be to get a degree in something or be a great parent. And as we get older and we have um, a hip, <laughs> a hip replacement, that point might be to walk like I used to last year. Okay, so those things change. So I'm on page 18 of your book, and they have Maslow's hierarchy. It's just they have it in stair steps. So I just drew like part of a pyramid here. And how does it um, relate with us in healthcare? So let's take the bottom. And, and, and if we're um, making sure someone is having a physical need to require it, it's... Um, Deliver correct food tray. Assist with feeding as necessary. So give them water if they can't get up and encourage them to drink. Um, use preventions to prevent eliminate uh, infection. Okay, and that's part of safety too, though. Um, and some of these overlap, but assist as needed with elimination. That means to take them to the toilet. Position for easy breathing. 
uh, reporting physical changes, uh, tend to physical needs, and reposition those people frequently that can't move um, themselves. And safety and security, uh, maybe you knowing the emergency procedures, this is a big one, keeping some kind of call light or signal light, and even in the uh, assisted um, livings, they often have medallions and lights. Um, and then for belonging, right, it's, and sometimes it says love, love and belonging here, but it's um, show that you care, right? Promote interactions with others. Um, just being patient and kind. Maybe touching someone on their, it's not there, but on their shoulder to show them that you care. Self-esteem is encourage their independence. That's always a big one. Um, praise them when appropriate. Ask for their opinions, how they want things done. And the last ones might be um, to just be supportive of where they are. Enthusiastic, oh, that patient that had hip replacement, oh, you're walking better today. Come on, let's go and try again. Okay, so you're being positive about their, their goal right now. Okay, communication is huge, um, but also knowing when basic needs aren't met, then um, people are just not the same. So they're affected both physically, emotionally, mentally, and socially when basic needs aren't met, right? Maybe being able to breathe, having to go to the bathroom and not knowing to take them there. And so common reactions to these needs include these unmet needs, depression, anxiety, fear, anger, hostility, withdrawal, and physical ailments. Um, needs have to be satisfied at one level in this pyramid before moving towards this, the higher level and the highest level of self-actualization. Now, as I say, they overlap. However, we want to make sure those bottom ones are, are met first. Building relationship. Well, to get off to a good start, you want to, and I'm going to say, have respect. R-E-S-E-P-C-P-T. Anyway, respect. Um, and, and that's going to be, you'll be kind, you'll be caring, you're courteous, you respect respect their individual values, beliefs, preferences, um, provide a safe and comfortable environment. So meaning, if the place is a mess around the bed, we're going to have to clean it up a little bit so they're not falling on things when they get out of bed. Um, and always not knock on the door before entering a, a client's room, all right? Um, introduce yourself. You want to listen. You want to um, not just introduce yourself, but um, greet them by their last name, unless there's another name they want it, um, you to use. Always, of course, encourage friendships and choices and be supportive of, of them. Hey, and you should know who their significant other is. You know, is it a relative, friend? Um, who is the important person to them? And it may not always be who you think. So be aware of your resident's significant others. You know, make sure you help with their visits. And, and, and it could be little things like, okay, the person's in. Give them a chair to sit. Make them feel comfortable. Try to do things when they're not there, like if you have to bathe the patient. Make sure they're ready when they come. Um, to visit um, and make sure you um, could also communicate with those significant others, make them feel welcome, and don't get involved in family matters. Now, these are adults we're working with, and so you're going to have to deal with their sexuality in a mature and professional manner. Everyone's different, and, and people may have needs. Um, so if it's consulting adults, as long as no one's in danger, you know, we've got to give them privacy and respect that. Good communication skills in, include speaking, slowly, usually, listening, getting feedback. Okay, so how are we going to keep building these communication skills? One, follow direction. Try to build trust. Um, Try to be a problem solver. Just don't listen, but be a problem solver. Try to give clear messages. Be non-judgmental in whatever um, your clients or their families say. Um, explain procedures. That seems so simple, but to me that's one of the most important ones here. And I mean step by step. 
I want to give you a bath. Okay, let's get you undressed for, first. I'm going to get the water. What are you doing? I'm going to raise the bed. Getting you a bath blanket step by step and tell him um, about how long it's going to take. Um, you know, it should take about five minutes to do this or 10 minutes to do this and tell them as you're going along and give them time. Do you have questions before I start? Hey, words are just a small part of communication, and anyone who's been in a different country or working with people that speak different languages, I'm sure you were probably able to communicate some way without speaking the same language. So keep that in your mind, right? So we're going to use, they say, nonverbal messages. This nonverbal carry more meaning than the verbal often, right? So nonverbal. Your facial expressions, are you smiling, do you look mad, your gestures, your tone of voice. Oh, what are gestures? So if I'm telling someone to brush their teeth, I'm going to hold up a, pretend this is a toothbrush, toothbrush and say, it's time to brush your teeth, okay? They may not understand what I said, but they're looking at my gestures, okay? And I like to demonstrate everything that we're going to do, well, not everything, but as many things as I can before we do it, unless the person understands totally. Um, your tone of voice, um, are your posture, do you look like, like you really want to go home? Or, and you're, or you let me help you, you know, holding your hands out, eye contact, silence is okay. Sometimes just being there is, is the best thing. And to gently touch people. Okay, so you want your verbal and nonverbal to match, right? So if they, uh, uh, a thing where they wouldn't match is, and I'm going to say, oh, don't worry about that, um, which is a cliche that we shouldn't be saying anyway. But I could also say, oh, don't worry about that, right? Different, same words, but different message. Um, so we try to use those to communicate as clearly as possible. So listening is a huge part of communication. And active listening means to, here, active listening, that you're really concentrating on it. Um, and that you avoid interrupting. So let the person finish their sentence. And let, when they're talking, try to think about what they're saying and don't even try to come up with an answer, which is my, I do that all the time. I'm thinking, okay, what should I say? But you want to get that information, then develop an answer. It, it, it's better to have those pauses. So don't prepare an answer until the client has finished their sentence. And then ask if you don't understand. And that includes both a, um, a, uh, for a client that's telling you something or someone giving you instructions, you know, your supervisor. Feedback is giving back the information that you heard, so you're sure that that's what they wanted. So um, this way it avoids confusion. You might have heard one thing, but that's not what they meant. So a good way to do that is to paraphrase. And paraphrase here means to... Um, Repeat what you heard using your own words. So in, in my case, it might be the client says, oh, um, I, I don't want to shower till 11 because I want to see my daughter's coming, coming, and I don't want to shower till afterwards. I could paraphrase that by saying, okay, so your daughter's coming between now and 11 a.m., and you want to take a shower after she leaves. And they may say, mm, maybe I have time. Or... Or, no, I met really after lunch. Okay, so to sum up, effective communication, we want to listen. We want to be patient, wait for an answer. Up to seven seconds is, is what they say. So I ask the question, what does paraphrase mean? You should count one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Then expect an answer. So that's really letting people time to process think before you speak, and then I added this, think clearly and slowly is usually the test question in any nursing or healthcare book. Um, I'm going to jump down, don't interrupt, um, don't judge what they say, and when you speak clearly and slowly, you want to use simple words that we know that person understands. Now the one I left out was 
ask open-ended questions to get more information. So open-ended questions would be questions like anything that you can answer with you cannot answer with yes or no. So not do you have pain, but um, where is the pain? When did it start? How, um, what, what number would you give it on a scale of one to ten? Um, ten being the worst pain you think you could feel. Or, what would you like to eat? Not, do you want eggs, right? Um, so anything that they usually can't answer, they cannot answer in a yes or no. So when people are irritated or angry, a lot of times this kind of difficult behavior the basic needs are at the root of this, this conflict they're having. They're not feeling that they're loved or they're being able to share. They're not feeling any power, right? Um, they're not feeling like they're recognized and respected. They're not feeling the freedom to make choices. And there's no fun. So to help these things, we're going to try to give them this ability, right? So difficult help behavior may Signal a need just for comfort, understanding, giving them choices, um, putting a little humor in the situation. And every case is different, so that doesn't always work. But just think um, about that because there be a lot of times it's unmet needs. It could be physical needs. They may have to go to the bathroom and they're just irritated because they they're constipated. So to... Um, Work with people in difficult be that are displaying difficult, difficult behaviors. First of all, you have to stay calm. Step back. Stay calm. Um, be willing to listen. And, and try not to argue. I know I'm skipping around here. But those are probably the most important. The other is pay attention to the tone and volume of your voice facial expressions and nonverbal expressions because if you escalate by hiring your voice or looking um, like you're agitated that will just agitate them more and maybe just asking them how can I help you do you have any you know way that you think would work is a great way to um, try to de-escalate bring down that Okay, so if there's a conflict, first of all, I think it's good and it's not here, is that you try to identify the conflict, but maybe speak with another um, supervisor or something or your agency. How am I going to deal with this situation before it spins out of control? Okay, so before that happens, don't jump to conclusions because we think it's caused by one thing and it's caused by another. Try when they, when the client tells you something, try to use that paraphrasing to gain, to, to make sure you, um, use your feedback to gain more understanding. Um, and then, of course, you know, we're going to try to explore options, but I think it's better if you use your agency or your supervisors, you know, sometimes two heads are better than one. And try to come up with a possible solution and staying positive through this whole thing. Because it's not, Okay, if the client is emotional or you're emotional, that can, that emotional barrier can block communication and pre prevent being any kind of positive interaction. So um, try to respond in problems in a caring, courteous way. I say take a break. You know, say, hey, let's let me think about it. Let me come back later. Maybe we can try to figure something out. Um, but otherwise, if you start to argue, you can never argue. You'll never win, and it's just going to be a bad situation. Um, and and try to get someone else. Hey, let me think. Let me ask. Let me ask my agency if that ever happened. You know what we can do. Avoid being defensive because they may say you're the worst caregiver ever. And really, um, try to it's try to roll. Let it roll off your back. Meaning, don't take it to heart. Um, but again, try to get other people involved that you work with, your agency, your supervisor. Okay, last couple slides. Overcoming physical barriers, meaning there's something physically doesn't work. Visually impaired, cannot see. Okay, if the client has glasses, clean them and encourage them to wear them. I know that sounds crazy, 
but so often I have found they're in a drawer or they're not wearing them and, and they're just, they can't get up and put things on like they used to. So do that for them. Make sure if they can't see you, identify yourself when you're coming into the room um, and, and ask for feedback if you're telling them to do something. If they're uh, more physically impaired, we're not going to move things around in the room because they get used to it the way they were. They're hearing impaired, and there's a hearing aid. Have them wear it. Make sure it works with the batteries, and we'll go through that in a different chapter. But gain attention before talking to them because people will look at your lips. So try not try to face the patient and don't chew gum or suck on candy or something like that because they're mouth reading along with hearing. Okay, generally people just don't lose their hearing. It's like it goes away slowly, so they kind of put the mouth oral reading with the hearing and put it together. Get close enough so they can hear, but don't yell. Use gestures to help. And also eliminate background noise if and especially if they have hearing hearing aids, that will the background noise gets louder. So turn off the TV, turn off the radio, ask them first. Say, Hey, while we're talking, can I turn off the TV or mute it for a minute? Okay, so cognitively impaired. This is someone who has a hard time um, processing thoughts, right? They may have dementia like Alzheimer's um, and, and many other reasons. They might have had a stroke. So I'm going to tell you something the opposite of what I said before. In this case, I'm going to jump down here so you don't forget it. We will ask yes and no questions because this person can't speak to us um, but they may be able to nod yes or no so that's a person who has cognitive is cognitively impaired but the rest is the same use simple specific words speak s slowly and clearly we will repeat the information and you want to repeat it at first using the same words and that's the same thing with the hearing and prayer because they might have heard 80% of it but missed two words. So now when you say the same sentence again, they may understand it. And it's the same thing with the cognitively impaired. And of course, be patient. Okay, the last one is aphasia. And that is usually with a stroke patient, someone who's had a little bit of brain damage um, and they lose the ability to communicate. So that's total, but it not always total there's always increments here um, and so you want to address that person by their name definitely just like the stroke person use simple specific words you want to speak slowly you want to repeat the information again just like the cognitively the same way these are people that are cognitively in aphasia yes or no questions because they can't speak um so they could nod okay be patient don't talk down to them like they're a young person you know like they're a baby just um talk slowly and clearly now for these two also which is not in this part of your book or on the powerpoint they, you can use communication boards, and I'll put, um, communication boards have pictures of, like, say, a water glass, that they could point to a water glass, meaning they're thir thirsty, or a picture of a toilet saying they have to go to the toilet, um, a, a picture of anything, um, a pain picture, like, that they're crying, that it hurts, um, so there are different pictures on this communication board that they want a nurse, that they want the TV on, um, and it's pictures that they can point to, and that's called a communication board. Okay, um, and that is the end of our, our PowerPoint of Chapter 3.